Hi, my name is Skylar Church. I am a California real estate broker as well as a member of the education department at accredited real estate schools and one of the instructors. Um, so today we're going to talk about practice questions. Um, us at Accredited, we offer the course requirements to be eligible to take the state exam in California, but we also want to make sure you're prepared for that state test. And so we have a bunch of different preparation tools. And one of the things that we do and use are practice questions. So today we're going to talk about a few of those practice questions to help you prepare um, with um, that exam preparation journey that you're probably on if you're listening to this video. If you like the Type of questions that we have make sure to check out the link below as we offer um, um, for $50 our database for one year access to the database of 3600 practice questions so it kind of simulates what you'll be seeing on the state exam and gives you an idea where your strengths and weaknesses are and with every answer that you prov um, that you give though we also give a detailed explanation so kind of like what we do here but it's just a um, an interactive one you like a program that you use so let's get to it though and start with question number one it's a long one it's more of a reading question testing your reading comprehension broker a obtained a listing on seller b's home seller b told neighbor c that there was no water service to the home broker a went to the property and noticed that there was no water going to the property broker a showed the property to buyer d who did not ask about the water to the property broker a sold the property to buyer d without disclosing the lack of water going to the property later after purchasing the property buyer d discovered that there was no water going to the property and would have to pay to drill a private well on the property and in install a pressurized holding tank. Which of the following is correct? A, the lack of water was not a material fact. B, the lack of water was not required to be disclosed by the seller. C, broker A had no duty to disclose the lack of water to the property. D, broker A had a duty to disclose the lack of water going to the property because it was a material fact that would have influenced buyer D in their purchase decision. So even without going through the answer options, what do we know here? Well, Broker A is the listing agent to seller B. Seller B knows that the water, um, there is no water to the property. That is material fact that seller B has to disclose. Broker A figured this out, even if seller B didn't tell him about it, he did find it out on his own. So this is also a material fact. And remember, a broker has a duty of honest and fair dealing and a disclosure of all material facts to all third parties within a transaction. Due to that, we know seller B needs to disclose it, but also broker A needs to disclose it. Out of the answer options provided, this is a material fact, and um, so let's go through and see which one matches. The lack of water was not a material fact. No, lack of water is a material fact, so that's not correct. The lack of water was not required to be disclosed by the seller. No, it was required to be disclosed by the seller as it is a material fact and the seller knew about it. Um, so that especially is a material fact. Um, C, broker A had no duty to disclose the lack of water to the property. No, broker A did have a dis duty to disclose it because it was a material fact. And um, because of that, we have the duty of disclosing all material facts um, to third parties within a transaction as well as honest and fair dealing. So we would have to do that. And so based off a of process of elimination, let's make sure D is the best answer. Broker A had a duty to disclose the lack of water going to the property because it was a material fact. That is correct. That would have been that would have influenced buyer D in their purchase decision. Correct. Because remember, ultimately a material fact is something where had the buyer or seller, however they if they had known about it, it would affect their decision. So it would cause um, some um, issue in value. So yes, the best answer would be D. But remember, so the seller is also liable for this disclosure of the material fact. But out of the answer options provided, D is the best answer talking about broker A. Two, a person purchases a home and discovers that his home is located three feet onto the neighbor's property. This is A, an A, protrusion, B, encroachment, C, easement, D, license. So a purchase, person purchases a property and discovers that their home is actually three feet over onto their neighbor's property. So the three feet that they think that they have it um, over is now actually on their neighbor's property. What is this called? So 
even though it's talking about the person that has the property and it's going over onto the neighbor's property, it's still considered an encroachment. So it's an encumbrance based on use. Yes, it is protruding onto the neighbor's property, but that's not a technical te term that we've covered. Um, so that would not be the correct answer. So even though, yes, it is protruding onto a neighbor's property, that's not the technical term. Remember, what is an encumbrance based on use that would um, that fills this type of scenario? That would be encroachment. So even though we're talking about the person that is encroaching somebody else's property, um, it's still considered an encroachment. So don't get confused just because they're talking about the person that discovers their home um, is located three feet onto the neighbor's property. So it's an encroachment on their property where it is still an encroachment. So encroachment. Three, $250,000 home is built in a $75,000 to $85,000 home area. Man, do I miss those prices. Later, the owner decides to sell it, but can only sell at a price below the $250,000. His loss may be caused by A, bad luck, B, economic obsolescence, C, functional obsolescence, D, physical depreciation. Well, without even looking at the answer options, let's really dissect this question. So they're saying a home that costs $250,000 to, to build is in an area of lesser homes. And when he goes to sell it though, he can't get the full amount of money it costs him to build it because it's being affected by these other homes. Well, the best, best answer is because it's caused by principle of regression. It is being affected negatively by these other homes. Now, principle of regression is not an answer option, so let's then work it further. So, it's caused by properties um, outside of the property line. So, the loss in value that they're causing is because of regression, but it's because of the other properties. Now, what's another term for that? Well, that is something of external of the property line, so it's a type of depreciation loss of value called economic obsolescence. It's not bad luck. Well, it is bad luck, but you should have known <laughs> because of the principle of regression. Um, and it's not functional obsolescence or physical depreciation. It is external to the property lines. Um, it's caused a loss in value because of these other properties through economic obsolescence. Now let's break it down a little bit more so you can remember the terms of the depreciation, we, the types of depreciation we have. So depreciation is loss in value from any cause from an appraisal standpoint. We're not talking about depreciation from an IRS perspective. So because of this depreciation, loss of value, we have three different types, physical deterioration, functional obsolescence, and economic obsolescence. Physical deterioration is just when the building wears out. Functional obsolescence is stuff within the property line, so usually styling issues. Um, so if you have, for instance, an outdated kitchen or maybe a three-bedroom house with one bathroom and all the properties um, are two bathroom houses nearby, that would be a styling issue. Um, and then economic obsolescence or external obsolescence, this is external issues outside of the property line. So something that is happening outside of the property line, so this is the hardest form to correct. So going back to this question, this home is being affected by the other properties through the principle of regression, but it's through properties outside of their property line. So it would be considered economic obsolescence. It's figuring out what is the best answer um, given and also really understanding what they're asking from the question. Now, if principle of regression had been an option, that would be the best answer. Four, when comparing a straight note versus an amortized note, which, are, which one allows the payor to make minimum monthly payments? A, straight note, B, amortized note, C, partially amortized note, D, negative amortization note. Well, they're talking about a straight note versus amortized note. What do we know about it? Well, so a straight note is just another name for an interest only note. So you're only paying interest throughout the life of the loan and then at the end of the um, loan term, you pay your last interest only payment as well as the lump sum of the um, loan balance due. So that is an interest only, um, also known as straight note versus an amortized note. So we have fully amortized, partially amortized, and we have a negative amortized loan um, notes that you need to know about. So which one allows for interest only and then all of the amortized 
um, allows the payer to make just the minimum monthly payments. Well, let's see here. So, a straight note, interest only. That one is just paying interest, so the minimum amount that's due. That looks to be the best answer so far, but let's make sure. Amortized notes. Um, so when they have this, we're talking about just like a fully amortized, so where you're paying, um, we're in an amortized note. Remember, you're paying principal and interest with each payment, and the amount of interest decreases with each payment, and the amount of principal increases. So this is usually a larger amount being paid because you're also paying the loan balance down with a fully amortized loan. So you're not paying the minimum monthly payment. This is usually one that's a little bit better because you have the um, you're paying down the debt on an installment basis. Now we have partially amortized note, which is comparable to a fully amortized, but it becomes due and payable before the loan um, ends, basically. So if it's a 30 year, it might be based on a 30 year amortization schedule, but they're gonna ask for the remaining balance due and payable before that, usually maybe five to seven years in. But it's gonna be having the same amount of payments like you would be paying a 30 year um, amortiz a fully amortized loan, but it's just gonna stop sooner. Then we have a neg -am. Well, neg -am is where you're paying, um, basically your payments is that you would have for a fully amortized loan. Well, you're not even paying that amount. You're paying way less, so you're not even covering the amount of interest due, nor are you covering the amount of principal. So at that point, you're not even paying the minimum amount of monthly payments. Due to that, the best answer is A, a straight note. You're paying the minimum monthly payment, just the interest that is due. You're not paying any principal down, and unlike a neg am, you're not even paying the minimum due. So um, you're paying even less than the minimum. So straight note would be the best answer. Five, a corporation owns a parcel of land that is located in the path of the city's projected airport extension. If the corporation refuses to sell the property, the city may A, have the owner arrested under a criminal action, B, have no recourse, C, look to its police power to solve the dilemma, D, exercise its right of eminent domain. So we're talking about here, the government is wanting to take private property for public use, so for the good of the public. But to do so, they have to do just compensation. If the corporation of the private landowner is refusing to sell it, what would the city have to do? Well, to take that property, that private property for public use, they'd have to then implement one of the sovereign powers of the state. One of the sovereign powers that allows us to do that is through the power of eminent domain, where we can take private property for public use, public good, as long as they're justly compensated. And that would be through eminent domain. So that would be the best answer. Let's make sure though that the others are not correct. So have the owner arrested under criminal action? No. Have no recourse? No. Look to its police power to solve the dilemma? No. Remember, police power goes hand in hand with zoning. So the best answer is exercise its right of eminent domain. So let's get to it and start with the first question. One, an apartment owner wants to convert an apartment building into condominiums and list them for sale. The apartment owner must comply with the A, Uniform Commercial Code, B, Subdivision Map Act and the Subdivided Lands Law, C, Business and Professions Code, D, all of the above are correct. Well, what we have here is an apartment building wanting to be converted over to condominiums. What that means is they're taking it to where it's one building owner renting out each unit to different tenants to where they're going to have each unit be owned as a freehold estate and be then possessed um, by, the, um, by the condominium owner or they'll rent it out individually. So they're changing the type of ownership to where the units are gonna go from all the units being owned by one building owner to then each unit being owned separately. Because of this, this is actually being subdivided. Even though it's an apartment building, um, and to a condominium, it's still being considered a subdividing. And if it's over five units, it's called a subdivision. So a condominium can still be considered a subdivision uh, as long as it's over five units. 
Because of that, since they're subdividing it, we know once it's at least two units, the Subdivision Map Act applies where you have to go to the local government officials. So within the city or county that the property is located. But if it's five or more, the Subdivided Lands Law also applies and the Department of Real Estate gets involved because they have to issue, um, the commissioner will issue a public report. So the best answer knowing all of this will be B, Subdivision Map Act and the Subdivided Lands Law. That is the best answer. Two, a township is A, a 36 mile square, B, an 18 mile square, C, a 24 mile square, D, a six mile square. Well, what is a township? Remember, township falls under that government survey method where we have the um, intersections of the principal and base lines. Um, and we're gonna go through that. And then we use townships that are those squares that spread out. Well, the correct answer here is a six mile square. Now, why is it? Let's go through it. So California has three principal base and meridian line intersections. So these three are Humboldt, Mount Diablo, and San Bernardino. So with these three, we have these three intersections and we take these intersections. So for instance, right here, we have it to where, let's say this is Humboldt. This is the intersection that we have of the base and meridian line intersections. Well, we then take this and we have squares that go out. So this is called a township. So they go through all sides of this intersection and these townships are broken down into 36 sections. So a township is um, 36 square miles or six miles square. What that basically means is it's six miles on each side. So it'd be a six miles, that would do, six miles square, or you have 36 individual squares within a township. And so that's how we get the 36 square miles versus six miles square. And this is a township. Now a township is broken down into these 36 square miles and one square mile though is a section. So one section is one square mile. There's 36 sections within one township. And this all falls under the government survey method that we have of a land description method that we use. So a township is 36 square miles or six miles square. If we go back to this, that's why the best answer is six miles square. If it was 36 square miles, then that would be correct. But 36 miles square is not correct. That is not correct. A six mile square is the correct for a township. But if it was 36 square miles, then that would also be correct. Okay, three, usually a broker has a right to a commission only on the basis of negotiations which he completes during the term of the listing agreement, unless A, the listing agreement has a liquidated damages clause, B, he brings a court suit against his principal, C, a protection period clause is contained in the listing agreement, D, the listing involves the exchange of properties. Well. Remember, us as an agent are only parties to um, the agreement in regards to a commission. Well, within this listing agreement that we have stated, it usually has to where if you um, bring a ready, willing, and able buyer, a bit buyer, you, buyer, you are um, entitled to a, a commission during the listing period. After the listing period has expired, you are then not privy to a commission unless. There is one where if you guys have probably heard where there is a protection period um, clause. We have it to where it's called a safety clause, a broker protection clause. So there's a bunch of names for it. But what this does is it, it basically says once the listing has expired or um, at that point, the agent has to, or the broker, you know, um, has to provide a list of names of people they have worked with during the period that may have not actually consummated a sale. But if there is this protection period clause, it says, hey, if let's for it specified as maybe 90, 180 days after the 
listing has expired. If anybody from this list purchases the property, I'm entitled to a commission. So it's protecting the broker for, an, for a certain period of time to get paid a commission even after the listing has expired. So that is when a broker could be entitled to a commission is if there was a protection period clause contained in the listing agreement. Not all listing agreements have it, but if they do, that's then where they could get a commission um, after even after the term of the listing. Now remember the liquidated damages clause that deals with if a party breaches the contract, then there's a predetermined amount of damages um, that are decided. And then um, brings us to court suit against his principal. So this would be if he's not being paid a commission and do one, then you remember as an agent, the broker, particularly anytime we talk about an agent, we're talking about the broker, um, they would have to turn to the courts to secure our commission. Then we have the listing involves the exchange of properties. No, remember the commission is determined in the listing agreement, not whether if it's in the exchange of properties or what type of sale it is. Uh, it has to be determined in the listing agreement. Four, on August 1st, 2021, buyer Abel signed a purchase contract buying seller Baker's home. In the contract, both parties agreed that possession would transfer on September 30th, 2021. Property taxes would be prorated as of possession, not the transfer of title. On November 1st, 2020, seller Baker paid the property taxes for tax year 2020 to 2021. The closing statement would show... A, seller Baker paying buyer Abel, buyer Abel for three months taxes. B, buyer Abel paying seller Baker for three months taxes. C, seller Baker and buyer Abel even at the time of possession. D, none of the above. Well, I'll give you a little bit of time to think about this question because this one's a little bit of a thinker. You have to know about how property taxes work, how prorations work. Um, so read this a little bit. If it's easier, pause it. Um, and read it and see if you can come up with your own answer. And then I'm going to go through um, what um, kind of the train of thought of the correct answer. So what they're saying here is Abel is buying Baker's property. Well, um, Abel is going to um, be taking possession on September 30th, 2021. But they stated in the contract that property taxes are actually going to be prorated as a possession, not the date that transfer of title actually had taken place. Usually it would be on the date that title is transferred, but it was decided in the contract that it would be based off of the date of possession. Now, what do we know about property taxes? Well, we have a fiscal tax year that we use. So it's a property tax year of July 1st to June 30th. We do not do a calendar year for property taxes. So for instance, um, they're saying here that Seller Baker did pay the property taxes for July 1st of 2020 to June 30th of 2021 on November 1st of 2020. So because of this, we need to then note, hey, yeah, he did pay for it through June 30th of 2021 but we're talking about September 30th of 2021. What is actually gonna come about those additional three months of property taxes that are owed? Well, the seller actually is going to be um, needing to pay for those additional three months. So it's starting on June 30th, we have then July 31st, um, August 31st, September 30th. That's additional three months. So the seller is going to be entitled to be paying those property taxes. And that would then be prorated in escrow to make sure it's fair, where, where seller Baker is actually going to pay for three months of property taxes. And then buyer Abel will only have to pay for the remaining nine months of property taxes. So they only are... Um, uh, they're going to do of who actually owes it, who um, was um, owed the property taxes during that period of time. Um, and remember also to furthermore, to further explain this question, it says on November 1st, 2020, Seller Baker paid the property taxes for the tax year of 2020 to 2021. Remember, the first installment is due November 1st and delinquent December 10th. You could pay just for the first installment or you could pay the entire 
property taxes. So even at this point for the 2021 to 2022 property tax year, um, the property taxes aren't due until November 1st, 2021. Um, and that's why escrow is going to take into consideration to make sure it is fair for this property tax year. So the best answer out of all of these is seller baker paying buyer April for three months of property taxes to make sure it is fair. Five, if a broker makes a misrepresentation while relying on information furnished by the seller, the broker is entitled to A, a full commission, B, no commission, C, a partial commission, D, none of the above. So if a broker makes a misrepresentation, so this could be um, an actual fraud, this could be negative fraud, so intentional misrepresentation, this could be negligent misrepresentation. Um, depending on the intent of it, it could be gross misrepresentation. There's a lot of things it could fall under. But if he had misrepresented information because the information was furnished improperly by the seller, so the seller actually um, is the one that provided the misrepresentation to the broker, and the broker was relying on that information that the seller um, knew what they were talking about, but they didn't, is the broker still entitled to a commission? Well, Usually, in a listing agreement, um, there is a thing called a hold harmless clause. So within a hold harmless clause, the broker is held harmless for misinformation by the seller. So if the seller or by, you know, the principal, so um, in this case, it's the seller. So the broker would be held harmless because the seller ultimately was the one that did the misrepresentation. So the broker would be entitled to usually a full commission. Now, proving this in a court of law sometimes could be difficult, but based on the theory of law, they would be entitled to a full commission. The actual collection of it, that would be based on in court. So um, the correct answer would be full commission. Now, what would actually happen if the, um, let's say the buyer now wants to collect damages for this misrepresentation after the sale of the property has taken place, well, they're usually gonna sue the broker and the seller. So the broker will usually be on the hook as well as the seller, but then the broker could go after the seller to recover their damages that they had to, um, that they incurred. So remember, it's basically figuring out what is the question particularly asking, and then what is the best answer based on the answer options provided and what the question is asking. So the best answer is A, a full commission. Question number one, a seller issues a counter offer and the offeree rejects it. What can the seller do? A, accept the original contract on terms. B, sue for specific performance. C, file an interpleader action. D, do nothing. Well, a seller is issuing a counter offer. So the seller is now becoming the offeror and the buyer is receiving that counter offer and they're called the offeree. Because of that, the offeree, the buyer, has the ability to reject it. And the seller, when they submitted that counter offer, they knew they were taking a risk on the fact that they did not know um, if the buyer would actually be willing to proceed with that counter or try to meet them in the middle. So at that point, the seller uh, terminated the original, um, or basically them countering the offer, doing a counter offer, terminated that original offer that was submitted by the buyer. So now the seller cannot go back and try to accept the original um, the original offer. They sent a counter offer, which is a new offer. Now the buyer rejected it. So at this point, the seller could try to send a new offer to the buyer to see if they can find a happy medium, but there's really not much they can do at that point. So um, because of that, the best answer is D, do nothing, do nothing. They can't go back and accept the original contract on terms. They uh, they rejected the original offer by sending a counter offer. They can't sue for specific performance because there wasn't a contract. A file under pleader action, no, that would be if they were actually in escrow and somebody breached the contract. So nope, there is, the best answer is D, do nothing. Two, the following are essential um, essential to the creation of an agency relationship, except A, parties who are competent, B, an agreement to pay consideration, C, an agreement between principal and agent, 
D, a fiduciary relationship. So what is essential to the creation of an agency relationship? Well, we know that you have to be competent. You have to be capable. It has to be between the principal and the agent. There has to be that agreement between them. And with that agency relationship, there's a fiduciary duty obligation that has been created. So with that, we then know that the parties who are competent and agreement between principal and agent, as well as fiduciary relationship, are all correct. Does an agency relationship require consideration though? What is consideration? Remember that something of value, the bargain for exchange, it could be money, it could be a, a note, it could be anything of value. And with an agency relationship though, consideration is not a requirement. You can act as a gratuitous agent where you're still the agent, you have all the same liabilities and responsibilities, but you do not get paid. You do not get paid in any type of consideration, whether it be money and compensation or something else of value. You do not um, need to collect that. It's not an essential element to create that agency relationship. Uh, whereas remember, on a contract, consideration is required, but not for an agency relationship. So the best answer is B, an agreement to pay consideration. Three, a lease to a lessee is the same as a, A, sales agreement is to an equitable owner, B, trustee to the beneficiary, C, beneficiary to a mortgagor, D, all of the above are correct. Well, what is a lease to a lessee? So a lease, remember, is where the tenant has the ability to possess a property. They have that possession for a set period of time. Well, the tenant is called the lessee, so they're the ones with the possession, the ability to possess it. Now, of these three options, who has the ability to possess it here? Well, let's see, a sales agreement is to an equitable owner. A sales agreement is just another name for like a land contract. Um, and so you'll see those most commonly with CalVet, where you have the vendor and the vendee, and they have equitable title. An equitable title, so that equitable owner, is the one that is just having possession. They still don't have the legal um, title yet. They would it once they pay off the entire debt, but at this point, they only have possession. So A looks to be the best answer so far. B, trustee to the beneficiary. No, remember, trustee is that disinterested third party that assists and has the power of sale if the trustor defaults on their payment so the beneficiary can then collect um, the property and the, the, the money from the property. C, beneficiary to a mortgagor. No, remember, beneficiary is the lender to a mortgagor. That is to the as a buyer, but beneficiary deals with trustee, mortgagor deals with mortgages. So you wouldn't even see those two together because remember, the mortgagor gets the mortgage from a mortgagee. So the best answer would be A, sales agreement is to an equitable owner. Four, replacement cost would use all of the following except A, cost of improvements to the land, B, allowances for depreciation, C, a separate estimate of the value of the land, D, capitalization rate. So we have to understand the question here. What is replacement cost? Well, replacement cost is a part of the cost approach within appraisal. So on that cost approach, remember they value the land using the market data approach. So they do a separate valuation of the land. They then value the improvements of the proper of the improvements to the land um, and the cost of those improvements of what it would be. And then they will also at that point depreciate the, um, the property to its current condition. So they take into consideration physical deterioration, functional obsolescence and economic obsolescence. So with that, we know for the cost approach, we look at the value of the land, we look at the value of the improvements, the cost of the improvements, um, because it's a cost approach, as well as um, the depreciation. So A, B, and C are all things that would be taken into consideration when using the replacement cost. But the capitalization rate is not. Capitalization rate would be dealt with the income approach. So D would be the correct answer. And remember, with replacement cost, we're looking at um, the cost of the improvements with the same utility or not creating an exact replica. That would be reproduction cost of the, um, if we we're looking at the improvements underneath the cost approach. So D is the best answer. Five, can an unlicensed, unlicensed person sell a property and collect a commission? 
A, yes, if he or she is acting as an attorney in fact. B, yes, as long as the commission is equal to the amount of money needed to cover expenses that were only sale related. C, yes, as long as the unlicensed person is enrolled in a real estate course. D, yes, as long as it is commercial property. Well, out of the answer options, it has to be at least one of them has to be correct. But what is the reason where an unlicensed person can sell property and collect a commission? It's very, very, very rare that an unlicensed person could collect a commission, but there is one circumstance for it. So I'm gonna start from the bottom and work our way up here. Yes, as long as it is a commercial property. Does not matter what the type of property is. You have to have a real estate license to sell any type of property, whether it be commercial, residential, industrial, etc. If you're collecting a commission and selling a property on behalf of someone else and creating that agency relationship, you have to be licensed. It uh, doesn't matter what type of property. Then yes, as long as the unlicensed person is enrolled in a real estate course. We don't care that you're on the path to get your real estate license. You have to have that license in hand. B, yes, as long as the commission is equal to the amount of money needed to cover expenses that were only sale related. No, we don't care that, yes, you weren't really making any profit on it. You were just being reimbursed for it. No, you have to have a real estate license. And remember, with an agency relationship, consideration is not a requirement. So that is not something that is required. But yes, so with process of elimination, A looks to be the best answer. But why is that? If he or she is acting as an attorney in fact. So if that unlicensed person is actually acting on behalf of the, of the principal with the power of attorney, so not just being a real estate, acting like a real estate agent and having that agency relationship, they can sell a property and collect a commission if they're acting as an attorney in fact where there's that power of attorney established where they can actually sign on behalf of another person. Because of that, they're acting as another person. They're able to, they have the power to do so, so they are able to sell the property and collect some um, a commission off of that. So the best answer is yay, is A, yes, if he or she is acting as an attorney in fact. Let's jump into it and start with question number one. A seller accepted an offer for $300,000 cash from an unlicensed buyer who does not have an agent. Escrows opened and then the seller discovered that the buyer had opened another escrow to resell the property for $600,000 to a third party. In this case, the seller may A. Cancel the sale with the buyer B. Sue the broker for not pricing the house correctly C. Sue the buyer for not disclosing the other resale agreement D. Have no recourse so as always, when we look at the answer, um, the question anyways, we have to dissect it. And sometimes the best way to do is when dissecting it, not even to really look at the answer options so you can formulate an idea of what you're looking for. So what do we know? This is a non-licensed principal. They are purchasing the property. They open up dual escrow before even closing on the one that they're purchasing, they're acquiring for a profit, a $300,000 profit, double. Well, because he's non-licensed, this is a secret profit. Is that legal? Yes, because he is non-licensed. Now, however, if that principal had a real estate license, then it would be an illegal, um, it would be illegal because it would be a secret profit and he would have had to disclose it. So the seller at this point has no recourse because the principal does not have a license and they can make as many secret profits as they'd like. Had the principal, the buyer, had a real estate license, then he would have had cause to go after the buyer because this would have been a secret profit and illegal. The buyer would have had to disclose the profit. Um, but in this case, non-licensed, secret profit is okay. So no recourse against the buyer. Two, a broker lists a property for sale and then sells it. Before escrow closes, the broker's license is revoked. The seller refuses to pay the commission. Under these circumstances, A, broker is entitled to collect the commission, B, broker unable to collect the commission, C, once broker reinstates license, then we'll be able to collect the commission, D, none of the above. So at this particular question, we have to figure out what is the most correct answer. The escrow had not closed, so um, the odds of being paid a commission is low. Is he entitled to one? Yes, if the sale had um, happened, um, the sale did happen technically when they got it into contract, 
but no money has changed hands. So the odds of the broker being paid a commission during um, or basically is, until close of escrow is really what's going to happen for the likelihood of it. But let the broker lost his license middle of escrow middle of escrow so until escrow closes what's going to basically happen is he might have been entitled to one when he was licensed when the sale technically occurred but that doesn't mean much um, he lost his license so at this point for him to be able to collect the commission it's going to be after he reinstates his license he will be able to collect it but at this point in time he's not going to be able to collect it until he reinstates it because he's lost his license um, so he won't be able to get paid even if the sale occurred prior to um, him losing his license, he's trying to collect on it when he's, his license is lost. Well, nope, can't do so until he reinstates it. Nope. Okay, next question. A real estate broker must A, disclose his or her real estate license number in all advertising. B, have all advertising approved by the real estate commissioner. C, have a trust account. D, all of the above are correct. So which of the following is correct or are all of them correct? Let's see here. So disclose their real estate license number in all advertising. As we know, as the real estate broker or salesperson, all points of contact material you have with the public must disclose the real estate license number. There's a lot of advertising requirements that go into it. Whereas if you are a salesperson, you need to disclose your DRE license number as well as the broker you work for. You have to make the public understand you are not a principal. You are a real estate agent. But furthermore, if you are a salesperson, that you are not a broker. So you need to make sure they understand who you are with your DRE license number, that you're a real estate agent, but also who your broker is. So A, we know is correct. B, have all advertising approved by the commissioner, the head of the Department of Real Estate. It does not need to be approved by the commissioner, but you must abide by the commissioner's regulations and also real estate law. So in all advertisings, it needs to follow what the commissioner has set forth and also with California real estate law, but it doesn't necessarily every article of advertising used need to be approved. It just needs to be legal. So B is technically not correct. C, have a trust account. So a broker can have a trust account, but it is not required by law to have one. So thus, the correct answer is A, disclose their real estate license number in all advertising. If someone is acquiring land by accretion, what is the property line called where the accretion occurs? A, ocean line, B, riverbed, C, lakefront, D, shoreline. So what do we know? Accretion is the gradual buildup of land by natural causes. So when we have a session through accretion, then we know it's going to happen where um, usually at like a water, something by water. Um, that is the line where the property line is that's by water that's going to have this accretion happening. Now, is it necessarily the ocean line? No, that would be one way, but not necessarily on the ocean. Riverbed, not necessarily on a river. Lakefront, not necessarily on a lake. Those are options that the accretion might happen, but not necessarily at those lines. But the shoreline, yes, that would be the property line that where accretion actually occurs and the property owner would benefit from the gradual buildup of land. So they'd have an extension to their land and property ownership. So it would be the shoreline because where that shore is, it could be on the ocean, a river, a lake, but it is the shoreline where the accretion is happening. Five, the principle of substitution would be used by a real estate appraiser for the A, comparison approach, B, income approach, C, cost approach, D, all of the above. So principle of substitution, you're substituting one property, one item, something for another. So it is comparing. Well, it's going to be primarily used for the comparison approach, that market data approach. However, it is not just exclusive to the comparison approach. The principle of substitution is also used in the income approach. When, what are we doing? Well, we're using capitalization rates. So to pick a capitalization approach, approach a capitalization <laughs> rate, an appraiser would use the principle of substitution and compare capitalization rates. So principle of substitution is also used within the income approach. 
Now, the cost approach, when would that principle of substitution be used? Well, we have to value um, land. Land, we would compare land, and we'd have to use the market data comparison approach to um, figure out the value of land in the cost approach using the principle of substitution. So all three use the principle of substitution. Let's get going and start with question number one. With regards to fiduciary duties, a real estate broker is to the seller like a, trustee is to the beneficiary. B, a trustee is to a trustor. C, a grantor to grantee. D, all of the above are correct. So what I always like to do is, remember, we like to dissect the question. So we're talking about a real estate broker to the seller. So the broker is an agent to the seller. And when they're an agent to the seller, they're acting on behalf of their client for with a certain warranty of authority that's provided to them. But they have to do so with a fiduciary duty of utmost care, integrity, honesty, integrity, loyalty, respect, confidentiality, competence, keeping them informed, disclosing material facts, anything and everything you can think of that's good. So you're acting on behalf in the best interest of your client, right? That is basically what we are as a broker to our seller. Well, what does this kind of emulate? Let's break it down. So a trustee to the beneficiary. Remember, the trustee is the one that holds bare naked legal title. When a trust deed is used, um, and we use those primary as our as a loan with that coupled with a promissory note, well, that trustee is that independent third party. They hold title. So if the trustor, the borrower, defaults on the loan, well, the lender, what we also call the beneficiary, then wants to see if they can get the money back by what do they use? Well, that treat deed of trust that actually puts it hypothecates the loan. It puts the house as collateral. So the trustee then would step in and proceed with a trustee's sale to then be able to help the beneficiary get their money back. They're acting on the best interest of the beneficiary. They are still a neutral third party, of course, but for the beneficiary to get money if the borrower, the trustor, were to default. So that's kind of very similar to what we're talking about. So that looks to be a good answer, but is it the best answer? Let's see. A trustee to a trustor. So remember, the trustee is the one that holds this bare naked legal title, and all they have is power of sale. That's it. And the trustor gives the trustee power of sale. So that doesn't really have anything to do with this. The trustor is the buyer borrower. They're the ones that are taking on the debt, and they pay this debt back to the beneficiary, the lender. But the trustee is the one in the middle that holds that bare naked legal title. They're not really in the middle because they're a disinterested third party, but that trustee just holds power of sale if the trustor were to default. So they're not really doing this in the best interest of the trustor. They're doing so for the beneficiary. So B does not look to be a good answer. C, grantor to grantee. So with, when a grant deed is used, that's what we convey transfer title of real property in the state of California. We primarily use grant deeds to do so because of those implied in, um, warranties and covenants that are um, when we use a grant deed. So it has better protections. The grantor is the one that is giving, granting the property to somebody else, conveying that property to someone else. So grantor is giving the property to the grantee. But does that really have anything to do in their best interest like the fiduciary duty does from a, as a broker to their seller? No, it really doesn't. It's just conveying of the property from the grantor, so usually the seller, to a buyer, the grantee. It doesn't usually need to be a seller buyer. It's just when they're transferring the title to someone else, grantor to grantee. So not all of the above. So the best answer is A, trustee is to the beneficiary. That is very, very similar to what a real estate broker has to the seller when we're talking about fiduciary duties. A weird question, you have to know a lot about it. So basically comparing and contrasting concepts. Two, usually a broker has a right to a commission only on the basis of negotiations, which he completes during the term of the listing agreement, unless A, the listing agreement has a liquidated damages clause. B, he brings a court suit against his, um, um, against his principal. C, a protection period clause is contained in the listing agreement. D, the listing involves the exchange of properties. So... As always, let's look at the question. Pretend this question is like an essay question. There weren't any answers. We didn't even look at the answers yet, but let's pretend it's essay. So a broker has a right to a commission only on the basis of negotiations, which he completes during the term of the listing, unless. So they're saying here, when does a broker actually have a right to a commission when it didn't actually happen within the terms of the listing? So if the listing had expired, 
how could the broker actually get paid a commission? Well, they, if the listing had expired, when is the, when is the broker entitled to get a commission? Ah, when that broker protection period clause is in effect. Um, that is where it says, hey, if that is signed in the listing agreement, the broker says, I get a right to a commission during the listing period, but also if I give you a list of names of everybody I've worked with and they buy the property within a certain period of time after the listing has expired, well, I'm entitled to a commission. So that is where they could actually get a commission even after the listing has expired if that protection period clause is in effect. Um, so what looks to be here? The best answer would be C. A protection period clause is contained in the listing agreement. But of course, always make sure to read all the answer options to figure out the best answer. So listing agreement has a liquidated damages clause. Remember, that has nothing to do with us as the agent. And um, we are not, um, that is a liquidated damages clause is actually in a purchase agreement where the buyer and seller are agreeing to predetermined amount of damages if somebody were to breach the contract. So that doesn't really have anything to do with us brings a court suit against his principal. No, that's not when, this is for us, if we're having a problem actually collecting a commission that we're entitled to, then we would go and do so. Um, go into civil courts. And remember, who always does that? The broker. The listing involves the exchange of properties. Well, we could be entitled to a commission because of the exchange of the properties during the exchange period, but not just because there was an exchange occurred. So the time that we could get a commission even after a listing has expired, if it didn't happen within the term of the listing agreement, well, that would be if a protection period clause is contained. Three, how much of the broker's own money can he keep in his trust funds? So his trust account, well, how much money can he keep? A, $200. B, he cannot commingle his own funds with those of his clients. He must make arrangement with the bank for enough money in the account to cover service charges. C, $100, D, $25. So a trust fund account, remember this is a fund that is entitled or it's just for client money, funds that you've been entrusted by your clients to hold on their behalf. And we are, if we have this trust fund account, by law they say we can keep up to $200 of our money in the trust fund account without being guilty of commingling funds. Anything that exceeds $200 we would be guilty of commingling. So this is just to be able to handle those service charges, but we cannot have anything over $200 of our own funds that would be guilty of commingling, but the law states we can have up to $200, that is okay. Four, in an open non-exclusive listing situation, the broker who most likely would be paid a commission is the one who has A, communicated acceptance of offer to the offer or B, produced a person who, um, who would purchase under the terms of the listing. C, obtained a substantial deposit with an offer. D, secured acceptance to an offer. So remember, an open, non-exclusive listing situation. This is a unilateral contract where you can have um, listing agreements, open listing agreements with multiple brokers simultaneously. And whoever shows that they are the procuring cause is the one who is entitled to a commission. Well, Let's see here. So in this, who would then be able to show that they're the procuring cause? The best way to show that you're the procuring cause is you presented the offer, that offer was accepted, and you communicate that acceptance back to the offer or. That is then when we have a valid and binding contract. And that is where we can show we are the best shot of being the procuring cause, the procuring cause of being that agent of this sale. So that would be the best way. So let's see here. Communicated acceptance of offer to the offer or. Yep, that is basically what I said. And in this question, it does seem to be the best answer, but let's make sure the other ones are not correct. Produced a person who would purchase under the terms of the listing. So we might be entitled to a commission under that, but it's not gonna be the best way of showing that we are the procuring cause because there wasn't necessarily an acceptance there. Um, of the sale. So you have to be the procuring cause of the sale. So yeah, you might be entitled to a commission because you satisfied what they said they wanted, but that doesn't really mean much. C, obtained a substantial deposit with an offer. Remember, you don't need to have a deposit with an offer. That's not a requirement. So that would not be correct. Secured acceptance to an offer. So you can secure the acceptance, 
but that doesn't mean much because remember the valid and binding contract requires that that acceptance be communicated back to the offer or then we have a valid and binding contract that is how you actually properly get the contract um, a valid binding and contract by communicating the acceptance back to the offer or so secured acceptance to an offer well what does that mean how did they secure it we don't know um, the better answer is a because that is actually how you get the contract um, a valid binding contract and would show that you're the procuring cause then of this sale five what would an appraiser use to project gross income from an apartment property a actual rent b economic rent c accrued depreciation d none of the above are correct so an appraiser using to project gross income for an apartment property so Apartment properties, they are income producing. They don't sell that often. They would use the income approach, the capitalization approach. Appraisers then need to figure out what the net operating income for this particular property is. And the way they would do so and when they have to project that gross income is they would look at what are the market rents out there for comparable apartment buildings? What are units out there that are similar getting in rent? And that, what is, so what's the market rent? And that is what we call economic rent. So the appraiser is looking at the economic rent to project gross income for an apartment building, economic rent. Actual rent could be below economic rent because it's been in contract for so, or they've been had a, rent, a lease agreement for so long, um, for instance. And then accrued depreciation, that has, you know, that deals with the cost approach. None of the above. No, we do know economic rent is correct. Thanks for watching. I hope this video was helpful in your licensing journey and your studies. If you liked it, make sure to give us a big thumbs up as well as subscribe to our YouTube channel so we keep producing new content. But if you have any questions or if you'd like to check us out for completing coursework to be eligible to take the state exam or even for preparation to help you prepare for the state test, we have tons of options and I have our website listed below. Otherwise, I'm Skylar with Accredited Real Estate Schools and thanks for watching.